This is a special edition of Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the premier financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Now, for this special edition of Macro Voices, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Macro Voices All Stars episode number 50 was recorded on August 26, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. All Star Professor Steve Keen is back with us today, and this episode of Macro Voices All Stars is brought to you by TopTradersOnplug.com, the only podcast dedicated to quant and rules based investing. And right now, they're offering Macro Voices listeners a free book called The Many Flavors of Trend Following. I'll tell you how you can claim it at the end of this episode. Steve, it's great to have you back on the show. I'm going to start by telling you a story. I, uh, about a month ago, produced a couple of videos predicting that the ultimate resolution to Triffin's dilemma will be the replacement of the U.S. dollar as the world's global reserve currency by a new central bank-issued global digital reserve currency, a digital currency issued by governments that I believe will eventually take over and become the center of the global financial system. That was the central prediction of my book and this series of videos that I just produced. I recorded them a month ago, but they've been stuck in editing until now. And one of the things that's in the videos that I kind of made fun of a couple of central bankers who really just didn't seem to get it. One of them was Bank of England head Mark Carney, who, as of a year or two ago, was dismissive of digital currency completely. And I've got a quote from him and I kind of make him out to be the guy who doesn't seem to be smart enough to see that where we're really headed is toward a global digital reserve currency. About an hour before my videos were finally released after my graphics editor has been working on them for several weeks, about an hour before they come out, who goes at Jackson Hole but Mark Carney and pitches the exact same idea that I'm criticizing him as being one of the bankers who's not smart enough to see it coming. So um, unfortunately, it's too late for me to edit that out of my video so I don't look like an idiot. But uh, I'll, I'll just try to, to act like I, I know what I'm doing here. What did you take? Uh, what, what did you make of this? Because certainly, uh, I think that Mark Carney definitely surprised me. Now, this is something I've predicted for more than a year. But we're talking Mark Carney now, major mainstream central banker, it seems like maybe they're finally waking up and they see that digital currency, that cryptocurrency was just the opening act. There's a whole lot more to this story that's still coming and that it's going to change the world, which is something I've been saying. I wrote a book about it more than a year ago. What do you make? Because you, you know much more about the insides of central banking than I do. What do you make of this coming out of Mark Carney? Why would he suddenly surprise everybody with this announcement? Was it just to make me look like a fool as my videos <laughs> came out or what? He must have a spy in your studio, mate. He must have a spy. I was equally stunned because uh, a bit like you, I mean, I have a lot of time for the Bank of England in general. One of my best friends is the chief economic advisor, Michael Kumoff. I know a lot of the staff inside. They came out with a paper in 2014 supporting the uh, approach, which, which was which was called endogenous money, but a better way to describe it is bank-originated money and debt. That's the real world, not the mythical world of neoclassical economists who believe in this nonsense toy model of loanable funds. So the Bank of England came out and saying all that. But in all that time, I haven't had any direct personal dealings with uh, Carney. I've had personal dealings with, of course, Michael Kumoff, but also Andy Haldane, who's the chief of the research director there. I know a lot of staff inside, but I don't know Carney at all. So I was would be inclined to sort of have your overall impression of him at the time. I thought he was, I, I sort of treated the bank as having like two sections. There's the the staff on the ground who are who are really being quite innovative. There's lots of mainstream stuff still being done there, but they're open-minded to alternative positions. They actually hired one of my, wait for it, a student of mine who had not yet completed his master's. He got 100 for his master's, by the way, when he did, because he specialized in modeling shadow banking using my Minsky software. And uh, they appointed him because they wanted somebody who understood shadow banking and could model it. So they're very, very open-minded. So that's, that's one side of the bank that I'm, I'm quite positive on. Carney was an unknown to me. 
and I, I regard the top level of the bank as being a bit separate. They tend to they tend to be more obviously political in their appointments. They tend to also be more stuck in an old fashioned way of thinking. And the intriguing thing from your experience here and my expectation that you would have been right is that when I read Carney's speech, what's actually happened is he's found out a way to understand the need for a digital currency while fitting inside the conventional framework of neoclassical economics, which is quite intriguing. So if you look at the speech, and it's easy to locate, the bank is very good about putting its stuff online. He's talking about, um, well, I'll start with one little personal observation. People in authority become radicals when they retire. This has happened to Victor Constanzo, who was one of the members of the European Central Bank, whom I met before the uh, before he retired and was defending the usual ECB positions after he's been arguing in favour of effectively abolishing the, the Maastricht Treaty. So they, they change. Chikani's about to leave and he said that, uh, he said, well, with six years later with my demise as governor on the horizon, I'm going to pay it forward by focusing how the nature of the IMFS, International Monetary Financial System, challenges monetary policy. And what he um, says is that the mainstream view, this is again a quote, has it's been that countries can achieve price stability and minimise excessive output variability by adopting flexible inflation targeting and floating exchange rates. The gains from policy coordination were thought to be modest at best, and the prescription was for countries to keep their houses in order. In other words, let the free market reign uh, in every country, let it reign internationally, no coordination necessary. But he then says this has become untenable for a number of reasons, though there's globalisation has mean there's been more impact of international developments in our economies. There's a growing dominance of what he calls the DCP, dominant currency pricing. And by that, what he means is that people are now, because international trades take place in American dollars, because American dollars are therefore accepted for any international transaction and, and lots and lots of, of, of domestic transactions are valued the same way. People are pricing, even though there might be you know, a country, a, a company in Ethiopia selling to one in um, India, let's say, they price in dollars. So this is becoming an international system. Now, he then tries to understand this in a neoclassical framework, and this is where I find it quite funny, but it explains why he's come up to it. In particular, the IMFS, International Monetary Financial System, is structurally lowering the global equilibrium interest rate, R star. Now, did you know there was such a thing? The global equilibrium the interest, interest rate. rate. <laughs> ah, and as soon that, as I that, saw that, that's on the the that's the symbol for that. It, it's the G E I R futures contract. Uh, no, no, no. Don't have that one on my. <laughs> don't have that one on my screen. Sorry. No, no, no. So what, when I saw it, my my first reaction was go duh. But then I realized you can't get, you know, the old saying, you can't get somebody to understand something if their job depends upon them not understanding it. Well, another part of it is you can't get somebody to understand something if they can't express it inside their own intellectual framework. So when you and I are talking, as we do, about the need for a global currency, and we're very critical of international financial flows, the banking system, you know, you name it, we're heretics in that sense. Carney is part of the orthodox religion. So the only way he could understand it is by putting it in orthodox terms, and that's what he's done. So what he sees is that there is such a thing as a global equilibrium interest rate, the interest rate which would guarantee global equilibrium, whatever that bloody well amounts to. And that is feeding a global savings glut as EME, emerging market economies, defensively accumulate reserves of safe US dollar assets against the backdrop of an inadequate and fragmented global financial safety net. Of course, there is none because we're talking a free market, reducing the scale of sustainable cross-border flows and fattening the left-hand tail and increasing the down, downside skew of likely economic outcomes. So he's he's talking in terms of two rates of interest. One is a global R star, this equilibrium interest rate for the entire global economy. And then there's a domestic R star. And he says, us as central bankers are trying to work out what the domestic R star is, the domestic equilibrium rate. When the international system was making small disturbances, we could do that without worrying about it. But the disturbances are so big, now it can no longer be sustained. So we have to give up on believing we don't need to coordinate at the national level. We need to coordinate at the international level. 
Steve, you actually attended the Central Bank Digital Currency Conference in Sweden. Uh, I didn't get an invitation, unfortunately. So you're more in touch with what these guys are thinking. And, and it sounds like your view is probably what's going on with Carney is he's smart enough to see that digital currency is the future. And maybe if he makes some ruminations to that effect on the way out, he can claim credit for it in some way without actually doing something. But I'm much more interested in whether these guys are finally waking up to the obvious, which I don't think they are. And I want to read, this is directly from the executive summary of the IMF's paper on central bank digital currency. And it says, with respect to monetary policy, CBDC is unlikely to affect monetary policy transmission significantly, although operations may need adaptation. Transmission could strengthen if CBDC spurs greater financial inclusion. Interest-bearing CBDC would eliminate the effective lower bound on interest rate policy, but only with constraints on the use of cash. So in other words, they're smart enough that they've figured out that if they wanted to ban cash to enable negative interest rate policy, that a, a digital currency might help them achieve the goal of banning cash. Well, that was painfully obvious. What they don't seem to have figured out yet, the way I would have written this paper, nobody from the IMF invited me to collaborate in case anyone's curious. Uh, what I would have said is the single most important point to understand about CBDC focuses entirely on the entirely new generation of monetary policy tools beyond central bankers' wildest imagination, which are enabled by digital currency technology. We have the opportunity to advance the IMS more in the next 15 years than it has been advanced in the last 500 years by engineering new monetary policy tools, which unlike policy rates, which are horse and buggy technology, you're trying to set a rate under your control, hoping that market forces will somehow transmit it into market rates, which will indirectly have an effect on credit expansion, which is what you're really trying to affect. Dude, why not design a digital currency system that gives central bankers direct access to creating incentives and disincentives for credit expansion, which is what they're trying to accomplish? That's the kind of monetary policy revolution which is possible with digital currency technology. As of this IMF report, they don't freaking get it yet at all. Do you think that maybe Carney is a sign that they're waking up or is... Uh, no, I think you're talking more about what you can do domestically, I'll take it. Is that correct? Like what do you mean? Well, you... I, I, I'm talking about how you could use... Digital. I think that what the entire central banking community is doing is they're reacting to cryptocurrency, which is the most yeah, ridiculous definitely. thing. Cryptocurrency was designed by anarchists who have the intentional goal of defeating monetary policy. Their goal was to design Bitcoin to make monetary policy impossible. They wanted as a design objective for the Bitcoin currency system to prevent it from being affected by monetary policy. That's what it was designed for. And what they're doing is they're looking at this saying, hmm, these cryptocurrencies really don't give us any, any new tools for monetary policy. That's too bad. Well, duh, of course they don't. They were designed by anarchists. <laughs> if you take the same underlying technology and reconfigure it in a different way, you can design a currency system which gives central bankers orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude, more control over monetary policy than they've ever had before. And nobody seems to be seeing that. One of the other things I talk about in my book is I've got a whole chapter about the importance of a digital sovereign bond market. Because ultimately, if you want to, to have a digital currency be the new global reserve currency, which is what Carney is finally talking about, you've got to provide a superior alternative to the U.S. Treasury market that has the depth and liquidity characteristics that the U.S. Treasury market has that allows it to absorb central bank-sized capital flows. Uh, I've described in the book how you can use digital currency technology to design that digital sovereign bond market, even if you don't have the market capitalization of the U.S. Treasury market, and how technology can assist with that. As far as I can tell, the central banking establishment is categorically clueless with respect to these things. They've managed to figure out that a digital currency would allow them to outlaw cash. That seems to be as far as, as of the IMF white paper, as they've gotten. Do you think Carney's on to something more?
more, or is he just looking for a, a little bit of a photo op here? No, I think he's actually under a bit more. And I, what I'd expect is, I mean, having dealt with quite a few central bank people, I mean, a lot of them are straight mainstream thinkers, can't go outside the, the envelope there within. They've been educated inside and so on. But quite a few of them uh, have more of a capacity to think outside, mainly because they were so confident that they knew what how to run the economy back before 2008, that when the crisis hit and they were in positions of responsibility and, and power fundamentally, they were flabbergasted. They were devastated. I, I won't give any particular names, but I have spoken to a mainstream neoclassical trained central bank economist who say they didn't see the financial crisis coming. They were completely flummoxed by it and they realised there's something wrong with their models. You won't get a mainstream academic economist admitting that because they don't face the, the torch of being told off by a central bank governor who's got to go and deal with a with a, with the minister for Ministry of Finance or the Treasurer or the Prime Minister and be told, you walked us into the garden path here. What the hell's going on? You obviously don't have a clue. So there's more there's more flexibility in the central banks than you might imagine. And that's why, of course, the Bundesbank came out supporting the concept that the post Keynes has been pushing for half a century now, along with the Bank of England, the banks create money that that credit plays a vital role in the economy and so on. So he's onto a bit more. But the intriguing thing is he's focusing mainly, and I think I, he, there's, there's one word that he does not use anywhere in the paper. Now, can you guess which word I'm thinking of? Nope. Trump. Uh, because obviously Trump has completely destabilized the global financial system in the sense that he's now using America's hegemony over money, international money, so he's always a weapon. He's whacking up tariffs left, right and centre. He's told Swift they can't have any dealings with Iran. He's then trying to tell the Europeans they can't can't bypass Swift. They can't bypass the American dollar and their trade dealings with Iran. So, and then everything else he's doing is totally disrupting their apple carts. And they're thinking, holy hell, We've got a we've got a, a lunatic in chain in charge of what we have to admit is a lunatic system, which is where you have an international one a domestic currency uses the international currency. So I think this has been the real accelerator and the waking up to themselves here. He doesn't just use the word at any point in the document, but he's basically giving sensible reasons as to why having a domestic currency as the international exchange currency will lead to trouble no matter what. Now, this is what my particular branch of economists, post-Keynesians, have been arguing for, again, 50 years. Keynes, of course, wanted to have the Bancor established, a non-national currency for international trade. I've been saying for a couple of decades, we need to bring about something like the Bancor in some sense. And what Carney is saying fundamentally is the same thing as, as I've been saying, that the digital currencies offer a way of doing it. You have a digital currency which is pooled effectively on the basis of the value of, of the economies that are linked to it and potentially issued and in, initially issued in in relation to the size of each national economy. So America would get, China would get more, more of these than anywhere else. America would get it number two, you know, Japan number three, that sort of thing in terms of volume of them. And then they could, they could use that to stabilize the international system because at the moment of course everybody needs american dollars so everybody buys american dollars so the american dollars overvalued etc cetera, etc cetera. these are parts of these reasons why trump is being the bull in the china shop that he is now he's saying let's bring in a digital currency to do it instead and i think this has legs but the thing you're not going to like my dear mate guess which concept of uh, a digital currency he's thinking perhaps we should piggyback on top of Oh, boy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Libra with your, well, fav- your favorite man, Mark Zuckerberg, from one mark to another. Well, and in some ways, and I can't believe I'm saying this, I, I couldn't possibly be more anti-Libra than, than I am. But in some ways, I do see and agree with his point, which is to say that what most of the central banking establishment was doing is they were looking at and reacting to cryptocurrency, which was a completely totally misplaced agenda. They should have been looking at what could digital currency technology, what would what would the new architecture of trust enabled by distributed ledger technology offer us? And one of the answers to that, and this is something I predicted in my book more than a year ago, is that new architecture of trust enables the engineering of a digital reserve currency in which for the first time in the history of the world, there is no one nation who's in charge of the reserve currency. You can design it in a 
way where no nation has undue power or authority over any other in an open system. Now, the prediction I made in the book, as I said, as much as that might sound like a better solution for Europe, the U.S. government is not going to like that. They're going to see it as a threat against and one of the, the things that I describe in the book is, you know, what does that mean? If Silicon Valley has the technology to create a new global digital reserve currency system like Mark Carney is dreaming about, which and, and the place where I think he's right to liken it to Libra is only from the standpoint that it's not trying to be a pseudo anonymous cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, but more similar to Libra. You know, everybody has to have an account titled in their name. It's not trying to to create an, an almost anonymous model. It, it's it's more of a traditional banking model, but it does use digital currency. It is possible for Silicon Valley to engineer with technology that exists today, and I talk about this in the videos I just released, it's possible for them to engineer a global digital reserve currency system in which no nation has undue power or influence over any other nation. Now, if Silicon Valley, that's located in California in the United States, were to do that, is that treason? I certainly don't think so. I think it's making the global financial system a better place. But if you're the U.S. government, what do you think about that? And and that's a, an issue which I don't think the U.S. government has even recognized yet is an issue. When they wake up, you know, when, when giants uh, wake up, they, they tend to react uh, unpredictably. And uh, when the current presidential administration wakes up to an issue, they, they act even more unpredictably. So what happens when the U.S. finally gets the memo and says, hey, wait a minute, this thing Carney's talking about is really a direct attack on the hegemony that we enjoy over the global financial system as a result of the dollar being, at, hey, wait a minute, that's not good for us. I know. This is, this is. I'm really looking forward to this. I must say, because the Libra. I mean, if Libra hadn't come out, I doubt the bank would have. Any of the banks would have got their heads around this that rapidly, because you know, I, you and I would both know there's an enormous amount of coding that goes onto anything like this, and you need bloody good programmers to do it. There's no doubt what you might think of Zuckerberg. He's got the good programmers. It's been put together in a in a way which doesn't immediately bring out absolute objections, like you know, Mark Zuckerberg hasn't got a, a common key to everybody's bank account, and there's supposed to be a Chinese wall between the Libra Foundation and each of the constituent members of which uh, Facebook is just one. And people, of course, I know you don't trust that, but that's that's it's set up in a way which doesn't immediately raise alarm bells. And it's also set up, I think, the, the initial level of transactions is supposed to support a 1,000 a second. That I don't think that's big enough for the global financial system, but it's in the right direction, it's certainly better than Bitcoin 7 per second. So I think this has accelerated the talk among central bankers about how to get away from the, the bull in the China shop effect of Trump. Now, of course, when it comes along, Trump, of course, wants his cake. He wants to eat it and he wants to eat your cake as well. And what about your daughter over there? He, of course, wants to eliminate all the uh, trade deficits that America currently has with other countries, such as such as obviously China, uh, but he also wants to do it while maintaining the United States hegemony and maintaining the current value of the US dollar. Now, of course, if this technology came about, if people actually did start, central banks did start meeting and talking about forming a, a bank or, which is what this would be, electronic bank or, yeah, I can imagine the the, <laughs> the American Navy might set it, find itself being sent on a mission to go and blow at the Bank of England. Well, with respect to Facebook, all I can say, Steve, is uh, in my book more than a year ago, I predicted that if Russia and China had an agenda to attack U.S. hegemony over the global financial system, they would not do it by trying to create a digital version of their own currency because that would not be effective. What they would do instead would be to create an independent central bank that would create a digital currency designed to compete with the U.S. dollar for the title of global reserve currency. And I predicted that they would domicile it in Switzerland. Now, do you think it's a coincidence that Facebook came to the same conclusion, even though they had much, much more docile intentions? Or do you think that the fact that they came to the conclusion I did, which is Switzerland is the place to put it, if you are trying to attack the U.S. dollar's hegemony over the global financial system, means that that is their true intention? That's what I think. 
Yeah, and I think that's what's. Uh, I, mean, I mean, this gives central banks a way to hop onto that, saying it's going to happen anyway. We can't restrain trade, and well, look at it's been invented by a bunch of American corporations anyway. They've chosen a nice neutral place like Switzerland. Let's do the same thing. Yes, this all has an interesting ring of not a conspiracy, but a coming together of minds in the middle of chaos. Steve, I likened it in the book to a new space race. You know, if you think about outer space and and little green men from Mars and ray guns and so forth, everybody knew about space travel in in the 1950s. It was just in comic books. Nobody took it seriously until October 4th, 1957, when the Sputnik satellite orbited the Earth and the U.S. government said, holy shit, it's not just comic books. It's real. Space travel is happening and the Russians are ahead of us. And I think we're coming to that October 4th, 1957 moment real quickly here where Trump wakes up and says, wait a minute, Carney just orbited the Earth with Sputnik. He's talking about taking this Libra stuff, which our Congress, for good reason, is saying, holy crap, you guys are out of control. And they're saying, wait a minute, we, we, we can take advantage of the fact that Americans did this and we can use it to usurp the dollar and get rid of that, that excessive influence that the U.S. government has over the rest of the world. And we can say it was Silicon Valley's idea. Um, I don't think the U.S. government's woken up to the fact that Sputnik just orbited when Carney was speaking at Jackson Hole. But I think it did. Yeah, I think that's quite a quite a good analogy. So, um, you know, watch this space. Basically, I think Carney has shown that you, that a central banker who thinks in conventional economic terms can put the need for a digital currency into that framework, and therefore it'll spread amongst that group. It won't just say to the in the uh, the research departments of the central banks where they are open to more flexible ways of thinking. It'll be something central bankers can nod sagely about. Oh yes, the equilibrium uh, global R star is destabilizing our domestic R stars. And bang, this can they can then say, well, let's put together a working group on it. And oh, we've already got this technology that exists. Let's see if we can get talk to the Libra Foundation about whether we can actually modify the ownership and the uh, you know expand it so every central bank is also a member, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And bang, we could be on our way to a digital international currency. I, for one, would be delighted to see it. I, um, I think a huge part of the instability and chaos of the global economy is due to an American dollar hegemony. Well, I am absolutely convinced that we will have a global digital reserve currency replace the U.S. dollar as the kingpin of the international monetary system. But I am extremely concerned about how that goes down. There is a huge difference between Mark Zuckerberg is in charge of deciding how money should work versus the interests of we the people are represented and something is designed that actually serves society, not just something that's designed to benefit the creation creators of the technology. And if you look at Facebook's track record with the, the Facebook product, I mean, it was clearly designed to monetize its users' personal data. That's what it was always designed for. But they very cleverly put something together that's really cool and fun to use. What they're going to do next is they're going to create a currency system that is way better than conventional money. It's going to be convenient, easy, and practical, and useful, and great. And it's going to feel so good and so much better than conventional money that everybody's going to say, hey, this is better. Let's use it. And they're going to do that with the blinders on, not paying attention, just as they weren't paying attention when they filled out, you know, why does a social media site need to know every single detail of your educational history and who your classmates were and who your professors were and everything else? Why are they collecting all of this information just so you can be on this platform? And people filled it out blindly anyway. We're headed down that same path. We need to make the digital currency revolution, which will redefine what money itself is over the next 20 years. We need to make it serve we the people, and we are not on that path right now. But we might be if the central banks get involved in the sense that, they're, they're, of course, they're, the trouble is they themselves don't, most of them, certainly at the top levels, do not understand money itself. You've got, maybe in their classical economic training, makes it impossible to understand the actual functions of money. But to some extent, it's better than just leaving it with the with the private group doing it anyway. And they may well then change the, change the rules, change the access Zuckerberg is implying there'll be a, a good set of Chinese walls between him and the Libra monetary system. Central banks, at least one thing I'll say strongly in their favor again, they've got a very high idea of due diligence 
and they have their anti-money laundering facilities and, and components to their to their uh, practices. They'll be insisting on that as well. And I I think I think the whole idea of sealing people's personal data in the guise of uh, of letting them do international transactions will be a no-no for the central bank. So it could be an interesting way to reform the Libra proposal. Well, I designed my latest two videos so that they are intentionally addressing central bankers and policymakers as the target audience. So hopefully they'll make a little bit of difference. And folks, you can find them on our macrovoices.com forward slash video webpage. And they're also on our YouTube channel. Well, Steve, I can't thank you enough for another fantastic interview. We look forward to having you back in a couple of weeks for another update. Today's All-Stars episode was made possible by TopTradersOnPlug.com. This podcast, which I highly recommend, is delivered to you by some of the world's leading practitioners and gives you an unprecedented insight into the world of trend following and other rules-based investment strategies, which have delivered outstanding returns for many decades. So if you want a different perspective on how to invest in today's markets without emotions and without predictions, go to toptradersonplug.com forward slash macro, where right now you can claim a free copy copy of the many flavors of trend following. Check them out. You'll be glad you did. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices.